So many companies have been taught to say it's such a great day at my company when a customer calls. It's such a great day at my company today. How can I help you? Well, folks, <laughs> that person on the other end of the line is having a crappy day. They are not interested in the great day you're having. And you send a message that you don't really care about what's going on with them. You're just concerned about your own day. And that is not what we're supposed to be doing. And this is what this show is going to be about today. This episode, we're going to talk about these little things that actually put a barrier between you and the customer. From Sarah Systems and Billy Go, this is No BS with Billy Stevens and Landon Brewer, the unfiltered straight shooting podcast that dives deep into the heart of home service trades to uncover the truth about running your business. You're entering the No BS zone with Billy and Landon. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the No BS Show with Billy and Landon. We're uh, excited to have you here today. We've got a great show. We're going to dispel all the um, old school and um, all the stuff that the gurus are teaching that we just feel like are out of date. And then we'll even, you know, let you know some of the old stuff that, you know, you could still use and do well, well with. And so today it's going to be kind of a fun, you know, talk about things and why they don't make sense. Um and so uh, my, my co-host here, Landon, um, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. I, so I guess today's all about relevance. All about it relevance. It's about you trying to hang on to yours, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Always, always good to be here to, to <laughs> give you crap, Billy. I'll there you go. For that. Um, I'm sure this show's going to get crappy from time to time, so it's, it's Okay. I don't know if those are bleep words or not, but we'll find out. All right. So we're going to talk about what are the gurus still telling you out there that you should probably not be doing anymore. And, you know, everything that we're talking about, we've, we've done it. We've done these things. We've stopped doing these things. And we know what the results are when we stop doing them. And they're much better. And so that's why we decided to pick on, on these particular items. So I'm going to start off with the greeting. So many companies have been taught to say it's such a great day at my company when a customer calls. It's such a great day at my company today. How can I help you? Well, folks, <laughs> that person on the other end of the line is having a crappy day. They are not interested in the great day you're having. And you send a message that you don't really care about what's going on with them. You're just concerned about your own day. And that is not what we're supposed to be doing. And this is what this show is going to be about today. This episode, we're going to talk about these little things that actually put a barrier between you and the customer. Uh, the things that we do that just don't really resonate the way they should. They sound great, but we can't keep doing them anymore. We got to move on. We have a modern customer now. They have more information at their fingertips. They have more information about everything and they don't have time for BS. And so stop greeting like that and be more empathetic, right? Don't you agree with that? I mean, just, you know, I think everything's got to be a strategy and a system. So, you know, I think the idea behind it is like, okay, we got a system where everybody's saying the same thing, right? But I I actually agree with your point. Now I'm sure in some cases it's it's, it's fine, but I can't imagine, you know, being 110 degrees outside, my air conditioner goes out, I'm sweating, my wife is yelling at me, you know, my kid can't do that. It just, it just, a, 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 a terribly emotionally bad day, right? I come in, oh, it's a great day here. And I'm like, it, it just pisses me off that it's a great day there. It's not a great day here. Right? That's exactly right. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I think there's, how, how do you answer the phone at uh, Billy Go? Uh, obviously, we want to say the name because we want to confirm that they know that they got the right place, right? And so we paid for that ad. So we want to confirm that we're the place they called. And and we always answer the phone with it. And we teach our folks to, an empathetic voice, right? Uh, very concerning. And we just say, thank you for calling Billy Go. How can we help you? And then we, you know, we allow the customer to you acknowledge continue. that they have, you know, whatever problem and, and have an empathetic and, and you have a script that they follow. 
That's the script. The script is how can we help you? I mean, it is as simple as possible. And we allow the customer to start telling them about their crisis. And then, of course, we have scripts on once the conversation, as it moves along, we have things that we say that make a difference to get them to book, right? We want them to book. And, but we start off like we care. And that's a big difference because, you know, think about it. Um, CSRs answer the phone all day long. And at some point during the day, they get kind of tired of it. It, it. It's just human nature, right? And so yeah. the empathy comes out of your, it goes away. And now it's more like, oh my gosh, the phone's been ringing all day. Ugh. Even though you still sound to yourself like you're empathetic, you're, you maybe you're not anymore because you've been stressed out from answering the phones all day. And not only that, they have you doing other stuff. Instead of just answering the phones like you're supposed to, they have other jobs that they give you. And then we have the fires that are always being put out. And so we just kind of lose our way just on the service call, on the actual greeting. And then uh, from there, it just can go sideways. We may book it, but it's just the little things that we want to talk about today that make a big difference. And going from there, dispatch fees. What a road blocker. Oh, my gosh. You know, we talk about Billy Go a lot on this, uh, this podcast. And, I, and I'm and i going to tell you, we haven't charged a dispatch fee in five years. Not one time. And not one time have we ever said, we got to start charging dispatch fees because we're getting bad customers. The reason why we started using dispatch fees is because if you get too busy, what do you use the dispatch fee for? When it's busy. To, to delineate out which customers you think are going to be good customers and which customers are not going to be such good customers. Yeah. So you use it as a blocker. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's basically being used as a blocker. That's the whole idea behind it. So why are we using it at all? That's So let's do a better job of determining how good of a customer you have on the phone by well, getting the right information. What happens when it gets to be 110 degrees outside and everybody's calling in and like, what, how do you delineate between which customers that you prioritize and which customers you don't? Well, you, I don't have any air. My house isn't cooling. I have one air conditioner and it's old. I know they don't know how old it is. They never do. They're guessing just like we would be, right? And... And so we get, we extract information so that we can figure out if it's something that we can do. And if it's a customer we already have, we have it at our fingertips that it's a five-year-old system. So we're going to help them out sometime today, but not right now. Right. So there's a good chance that it's, and if it's a new customer, you know, we do the best we can to figure out the priority of the call and the age of the equipment, just like everyone does. But we don't use a dispatch fee to to get rid of that customer. We'll book them, but we're not going to book them today. We're going to book them out in a, in a day, you know, the next day or whatever, and um, and fill our try to fill our board up with money calls um, as we go along, and and that seems to be what works. And I'm telling you, when you market no dispatch fees. You, your your phone will ring off the wall even when it's not busy, uh, the busy season. It just, people just don't want to pay it. And there's been studies done that shows that they don't want to pay it. And they want to do business with folks that don't do this. So let's stop doing it. You know, the reason I get my dispatch fees, I get my hourly rate every minute of every day because of the way we built our software I don't need a dispatch fee. I'm going to get our hourly rate. And I think our hourly rate is like 235 bucks. And that's our labor. That's not our flat rate. <laughs> Something else we need to talk about. You know, what is your actual labor rate? Not your flat rate rate. Um, and yeah. so I'm going to get 235 bucks to go to that call because I built my system to where I'm getting paid for every minute of every day. And, and so it doesn't matter what we're doing. If we're driving, we're getting gas, we're at the shop flirting with the dispatcher or we're out in the warehouse uh, playing marbles. Whatever it is we're doing, we are charging somebody for that throughout the day. And therefore, we get rid of the blockers because we know we can do that. So, so you don't believe that there's such thing as like, you know, 
my favorite word that salespeople use is tire kickers, people that are just calling in because they want to call in an air conditioning company that, uh, well, you know, I thought it was going to be a thousand dollars. I didn't know it was going to be $12,000. Like you don't think there's a such thing as a tire kicker that you can weed out by having a high dispatch fee. I think there is a, a way to get rid of those folks. And the way we do it is, is we get on page one of SEO and then Google starts sending us buyers, not tire kickers. And yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to, you know, <laughs> I'm inclined to believe that there's not that many tire kickers out there. Yeah. But for some reason, uh, apparently they, they've they uh, all called, you know, and companies I've worked with and, and my salespeople have all run these, these uh, 1% tire kickers. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I, so, so you've got uh, no dispatch fee. You, you're not using the traditional old school, uh, you know, it's a great day, whatever, and answering uh, thing. What is your booking percentage? Like, what kind of what percentage of customers that call in or, or come to you through email or whatever you capture? That's a great question. And so there's there's two part answer to this because I look at two different things. I look at booking percentage and then I look at the calls that we booked that we lost because we couldn't get there. Right? Yeah. To, to me, that is the the more important one. Even book it. Even if you book at sixty percent and you're still losing calls because you're overbooking. We have a problem, right? We're, and so <clears throat> my booking percentage is um, we're around 70, 71% is our booking percentage. But our flow through is around 85%, meaning 85% of what we book, we do the work. We literally go to the job. We get there. We don't lose it to a competitor because we didn't give them a fair enough information for them to stick around, right? Because if you tell a customer you don't know when you're going to get there, they're already on Google clicking on the next company until they get the answer that they want. And if they can't get the answer that they want, then it's clicking on five or six different contractors and whoever gets there gets the job. And so that's five contractors that paid that price for that click and didn't even go. And so that is what I look at. What am I paying for and then not getting there? And so I would prefer to run less calls, more important calls by doing a better job of filtering those calls, various different ways. We can make a whole show about those, those different ways. Um, that's not the show today, but let's, let's put that down as a show to do. Um, and be on time. And my company will, will grow because of that reputation faster than anything else. And, and we have, and we, we just feel, I feel like my philosophy, you know, is slow down to go fast, get, get rid of the chaos. Um, we can put extra people on the, on the board, like, like we do in the future. But at the end of the day, we're trying to run the best calls each day and just only run those best calls each day. We're not trying to overbook because overbooking, then you're apologizing to every single customer for being late. Every one of them, you're apologizing. So the way we do it is we don't overbook. Our software says, this guy can only do this many calls today. And that's it. And so it's, that's it. And if a better call comes in for that guy, yeah, the software will go, okay, well, I'm going to give him this better one. And now we're going to apologize to the lesser one um, instead of apologizing to all of them, right? And that's what we try to do. It's, it's slow it down to go fast. And so our average tickets are higher. Our close rates are higher. Our success rates are higher. Our repeat business is higher. Our LTV is higher because we actually don't overbook. Um, it's, I send the entire office staff home at four o'clock and we do this because we want a place where it's, you know, when, it, when people come and tour Billy go, they can't believe that there's a business running. It literally sounds like there's nothing happening. And so we've yeah. been able to control the chaos and we control the chaos through software. We let our software handle the chaos while we just do our jobs and do a better job at it. And so that is why I never charge a dispatch fee 
is because I'm getting great customers because the word spread. Social media will tell customers who they should be using. Um, if you do something really amazing, they're going to tell other people. And that's how we, we grow the business uh, so rapidly and so profitably. That's the main thing. I'm not chasing revenue. I'm chasing margins. And that's, yeah. that's our focus. Yeah. And um, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is, um, we, is spiffs. Where, where do you think this spiff thing come from? Where, where do these gurus come? Which gurus came up with this? I don't know. But, you know, we've been doing spiffs for a while and everybody gets, you know, political about them. You have the red and the blue when it comes to dispatch fees and spiffs. You know, you have those on both sides. But, you know, the cool thing about um, me building Billy Go was for me to just go in and try everything possible that's not the norm. And... And then pass that along to my, you know, friendly uh, competitors and friends out there in the in the world of the trades, is because I'm the only one that is taking that step of proving these things out and then reporting back on it. And so, spiffs. I'm going to be honest with you, Landon. Man, I hate them. I, I think I think I thought we thought that's where you were going. You know, even. Even to some extent, uh, you know, commissions, spits, like I was told a long time ago, like these things that you have to do to, you know, there's certain payment uh, compensation methods that are put in place. And it's it's really kind of a, a it's the penalty that you pay for bad management. Right. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a spiff, whether it's, uh, you know, having to, you know, give special incentives, whether it's uh, weird bonus programs you put in place, you know, different commission plans, like ideally everything is broken down in a perfect world into some hourly rate or, you know, and, and it's, you just hit metrics and you can improve your uh, compensation. But the, the, a lot of what happens is that we just don't have good management systems in place. We, we don't have a good way to pay payroll uh, in a easy, meaningful manner. Like people have, hell, I've worked in companies where people have absolutely no idea what they're going to get paid in their paycheck. Yeah. And it, it just most companies, most companies. And it, that and, it takes, it, and, it, and it takes two or three people uh, a week to put the payroll together. I mean, it's, 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 it's I actually, crazy. I actually ask that question when I'm out and I visit a lot of companies every year and I ask them, the department managers when they're, when they've got a pay system that I just go, Oh my gosh, this is complicated. How much time they spend. And the typical answer is one to two days a week are spent trying to figure the payroll out so they can get it to the payroll department. And then the payroll department hair goes on fire because they have to get it out by Friday. Right. And so now we're already into Tuesday, maybe Wednesday before they get it. And now they have to decipher it. And then if you get it wrong, you create a problem between you and your employees, right? Then there's no trust. And now we have a culture problem. And so this is why, one of the reasons why I hate spiffs is because it causes a lot of confusion, causes a lot of extra work. And let's talk about the numbers. Let's say you- well, the impact. Yeah, yeah, the impact. Yeah. Maybe we- Maybe we, before you get into the impact that it's going to have, maybe just for clarification, explain to everybody what a spiff is. So it's, everybody's got using the same definition of the word spiff. Sure. Um, so and my definition of a spiff is you send the guy out or girl answering the phone it does, or person answering the phone and you send someone out to do a job and you have a particular item that you're pushing. Maybe your rep came to you and said, look, I really want... I, <laughs> We'll use BioClean. I think Spiff started with BioClean back in the back in the early days. Remember that? BioClean. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I think that's where it started. <laughs> Is that the stuff you can supposedly drink? It's like uh, yeah, yeah. They taught you to you can drink it. Drink it, and you'll be fine. Yeah, you drink it in front of the customer. Did you ever drink it? Be honest. Did you ever try it? Heck, no. I wouldn't do. I'm, dr that. I'm drinking. It. I'm drinking some right now. There you are. You you getting some BioClean? <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Well, they say you're full of crap, so I understand. So there you uh, go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, a spiff is you give extra money for selling a particular item. Maybe you're pushing, you know, um, I don't know, a, um, gosh, a bio clean or if you're a plumber or you're, or you're you know, because I haven't done spiffs in so long, I don't even know. Uh, 
I guess you would be pushing, you know, some particular item in HVAC. Maybe it's a UV light or something like that, and you get a spiff if you sell one. And and so you may sell it, and 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 that all sounds great. Here's here's what they look at. Let's just say the UV light costs a thousand dollars to the customer, and you're paying the guy thirty bucks an hour, and then you give him a hundred dollar spiff for for selling this thing. Um, you just increase your labor cost by 42%. And so we can't look at the $1,000 that you sold it and you're just giving them $100 or $50 or whatever. You got to look at what does that dollar amount do to the labor rate that you're already paying. And a spiff exponentially increases your labor cost. Yeah. It's insane, the, the number that happens. And, and just that one spiff costs you 40% more and labor cost that day for that one tech, 40% in that situation. And that's why, another reason why I totally um, are against SPIFs and why we should not be doing them because there's several problems. All right, so number one, it's complicated to pay. No one trusts the outcome. It causes too much labor and too much stress in the office and in the management teams when they need to be managing techs or call by call, whatever they're doing. They need to be doing those things instead of dilly dallying around with these spiffs, and and so that's why I don't like them, and I don't like them in the office either when you're booking calls. I just think that now we're in a situation where we book any and every call instead of the right calls, and and so yeah, it, like it, so they're they're excessively complicated the, to track impact on more than just like the cash payment that they're getting it's you got the fact of food is food uh, overtime double time all that but even more important it, it's that, like if you got a system if you got uh designed a system to send your technician out to a home to you know follow along whatever protocol they've got and now you've got a uh, third party or some other incentive over here it's like okay well they're thinking in the back of my mind how am i going to you know maximize my compensation so i'm going to you know, look at the bio cleaner. I'm going to look at, you know, this specific thing that's got a spiff on it because it's going to maximize me. It's not, may not be in the best interest for the customer. It may not be what the, the organization should be focused on. Right. Yeah. I think it's a distraction. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, it, it's, and here's the worst. I don't know if what, you know, you mentioned bio clean, but, you know, as a plumber, especially, have you ever had these restoration companies? that uh, come in and, and offer to spiff you to send them leads. So, you know, you come out and there's some uh, mold or fungus or whatever and like, okay, well send us a lead. And then if it sells, we'll, we'll send you 500 bucks or something like that. You ever had those? Oh yeah. Yes. So, so I, you know, this is the worst that, that spiffs have ever done me in. So a uh, company, uh, large company, and uh, at multiple locations, and we had a uh, plumbing manager one location. You know, I'd set up a you know a, a kind of a national deal with a couple of these things, and and we wanted to control it and pay it legitimately. So we want run it through payroll. So uh, you know, they would give it to us, and we would uh, give it to the technicians, etc. So keep it all all legal. Well, uh, in one specific branch, the uh, plumbing manager made a side deal with the restoration company, and. He said, you know, for every lead that you send over, we're going to give you a couple hundred dollars and the, then you run it through payroll, pay the technician. So he was uh, collecting the money, never made its way to the, the company. He was approving the spiffs, sending through payroll. He was the one that was checking it, you know, and, uh, you know, we finally get through an audit after about a year of doing this because no one's really, it's not a key element of the business, right? And it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that, you know, we've paid out and got nothing for. And, you know, we ended up having to, you know, press charges against the guy and put him in jail. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. that's I'll, my worst spiff story. So that's, that's worse than any of my spiff stories. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess we're in agreement. here. Spiff's probably yeah. not, not a good thing. Yes, sir. All right. We agree on something. All right. This show is moving <laughs> forward. Uh, in a great way. Um, I'll spiff you later for agreeing with me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's All see right. What's next? what's next? Let's see. You know, I believe there should be bonuses, but I think 
it's how we do bonuses is what's important. I, I don't think you do bonuses in a random way because it ends up being a spiff in a way. You're not actually tying it to a particular item, but if you're bonusing regularly, um, it, to me, it's not something that's memorable. Um, and so the way I do bonusing is if the company does well, this is where we all win, right? If the company does well, then in the last month of the year, prior to the holidays, we look at what the profitability of the company is. And usually it's really good. And it, hopefully it's really good for everyone that's listening. If not, we're going to help you there, hopefully, um, in between the one-liners. Um and so in particular for Billy Go, what we do is we take a percentage of the profits and then we give it back to the employees. And we don't discriminate on who sold the most, who booked the most. It has nothing to do with any of that. It is a level playing field. And, and so um, I'm not sure what we gave this year, but I want to say it's somewhere between five and $8,000, somewhere in there per person, um, I believe it was. And so um, what hap What we do is, even if you've been working there three months, you're going to get your bonus as well because you helped us for those three months. And so we'll prorate it out over the three months and you get your portion. But the thing about it is, is it's a large number um, and because we do really well and everybody really works hard all year to, to be efficient so that we make a lot of money. And so nothing better, you know, it goes back to my past um, when I was struggling trying to figure out how to run businesses because I failed in so many businesses before I did, you know, I made it. I had to learn, right? I didn't have a guru. <laughs> um, I didn't have any of that. We didn't have any of that stuff. And I had to come up from nothing. And I know that every year we would struggle in the fall and winter. And, you know, Christmas wasn't the happiest thing of times we have any extra money. So it's very important to me to make sure everybody has lots of money and they can buy their kids everything they want. You know, that's very important to me. And, and so we started doing this, um, uh, uh, in my other company at Berkey's and obviously we started it immediately at Billy Go. Even when we didn't make money the first year, we still did it because we came from nothing to something that year. But the point is the bonus should be based off the business doing well. And I think an annual bonus has more impact because it can be larger if you do well and everybody shares the same. It doesn't matter if you sweep the floors, they swept the floors all year or you were the a $5 million tech, you get the same amount of money. It's, it's everyone wins is, is the whole idea. And so that way we create culture where we support one another and everybody's on the same, you know, same, trajectory, you know, of success. So what is your opinion? And on you share it with them? Yeah, well, so let me show you kind of what we've done. I, Cause I agree with you on, on all of that. I think it's got to be tied to the success and profitability of the company. So we build it in when we budget for the year with any of the companies, we build it in and we say, all right, uh, we, we build it through the KPIs, right? So here's how many calls we're going to run, the, the turnovers we need, uh, all, all of the KPIs. And we make sure that everybody's in agreement. This is what the budget is, this is what's sustainable. And, and uh, as we hit that, you win as well, right? So uh, having built it off the KPIs, we say, okay, here's what, uh, what your comp is. And you know, I mean, we build it so, so that you can double your comp uh, so that but we, it's built into the budget and you know, every day, if we have to add bodies, if we have to, if we don't hit a certain metric, if we hit metrics, like, you know, exactly what your bonus potential is and you just keep accruing it right as the period builds on. So if you hit the targets and it's built into the budget from day one, you know that you're going to get pretty significant bonus and you have a lot of upside. You can double your uh, income in every position, just like you said, every position in the business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, you want to see everybody hit it. You want to see everybody double their income because you know that you're building a you know, solidly growing profitable business. Yeah. And it's, it took me a long time to like perfect that, but 
but I never really like I, the idea of just giving individual bonuses for specific performances for hitting, you know, whatever targets. So this manager, if the uh, if they get this gross margin, then they get this bonus. This guy, uh, it's complicated you know, things again. It's never tied together well mm -hmm. unless it's all tied together from a to total budget. That's that's right, and we got to keep things simple because we inherently make our businesses more complicated with all these different things. And so keeping it simple is very important and then run an efficient, profit, profitable business so you can give back. And so <clears throat> how many employees do you think you could get if they hear that you're everyone that works there gets this massive bonus when most guys are sitting at home waiting for the next tune up, that's not going to turn into anything. You know, that's plus when you, you know, when you do it, uh, you know, my way, can, what, one of the initial ideas was like, Hey, if we could get, down to the warehouse guy, the parts delivery guy, the, you know, uh, the girl that's in uh, whatever accounting position. If we could get everybody in the business to, to you know, down to the, the part-time uh, delivery driver, being familiar with the KPIs of the business, understanding what revenue requirements there were, how many calls we needed to run, how do we, like, if you can get that level of knowledge built into your organization, because, you know, like we always talk about, about your school, it, your business is a school for your employees. If we can get the, the part-time delivery guy understanding the KPIs of this business, there's no telling how large we can build it, right? That's right. I mean, it's all about the people. <laughs> Give back. But do it without causing confusion because confusion kills culture. <laughs> you just got to be yeah. simple with stuff. Just quit doing all the extra things. You know, I, I have a very simplified pay system that rewards everyone really well and <clears throat> we have there's hundreds of people using it now and it really drives success all across the company and and so that's that's how we're able to make money and then give a big bonus on the end so sounds like we're um I, sound like we're on the same page there i i, I got a controversial one for you this right. old school that uh is probably still you know preached by most of these best practice groups and stuff. Uh, what about the white shirt, no facial hair, no tattoos, uh, you know, clean shaven? Like, what, what do you think about all of those requirements in today's modern world? And by the way, I can see that you're, you have a beard, so you may be in violation of your standards. Yeah, I'm not allowed in the building. <laughs> Man, we we don't do any of that. Um, we literally buy our own shirts. We have a Billy Go logo on it. It's orange. It's a it's a polo type shirt. Um, we do do provide them with some you know work pants. We don't want them in jeans. That's my only thing. No jeans. Um, and then we also uh, provide them with with the shoes, so they get to choose you know between a boot or a type of a shoe, but. Um, I don't have any restrictions on facial hair. I don't have any restrictions on uh, tattoos. I mean, what are you going to do about that? I mean, almost everybody has a tattoo now. I don't have any, but um, most people do. And so you're going to see him. I do. I just always joke that when that guy in that pressed white shirt with the American flag on the sleeve shows up, you're going to pay. Uh, there's a technician that doesn't do any work. <laughs> White shirt, no wrinkles. Yeah. Fresh cologne. Yep. You know, clipboard, little pencil. Like you're about to, you're about to pay through the nose. Yep. You're about to pay through the nose. <laughs> and um, you know, one <laughs> one of the things we got to remember is we got to be local. You know, people want you to feel local, and if you're a local company and you're going in this white press shirt and, and an American flag on it and all the stuff that, you know, requirements, you know, it's not a, that's not a plumber for sure. Um, and it's, and it's just, uh, I don't know. It's not something we, we do. I don't really, I, I never did it. Let's just put it that way. We I mean, never, I, I we think never some of it that just comes down to common, common sense. I, yeah. I can't believe that you know, even in the 80s and 90s, writing this stuff and putting it in books, it's like, can you apply basic common sense? 
Yeah. Like, don't show up disgusting. Right. You know, uh, if you don't brush your teeth ever, probably shouldn't be talking close to a customer. That's right. Gross, right. If you, you know, don't, don't show up with crap in your hands. Don't show, like, don't show, just apply basic common sense. And if you see somebody that's not, you know, as hygienic as they should be, tell them. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe exactly. it, it may not be suitable for HR, but like, yeah, I just don't think that you feel a customer will feel like you are there to help them do work if you don't even look like you've worked all day. Um, it's just that local feel the customers want, no matter what. Uh, the private equity firms are f spending tons of money advertising that they're local, right? That they're local, they live here, they do all that. And it's all about being local. And customers don't want to deal with big corporations, but they don't know. And the white shirt gives it away and they figure it out. You see it on, you know, yeah. next door, stuff like that. You see, you know, avoid the white shirts, uh, the pressed white shirts when you, when you want a technician. And so it happens, but again, they're successful as well. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't believe in that anymore. Anyway. It all comes down, it all comes down to, you know, kind of the avatar of your customer and what your brand is. So if, if you're the, the brand that, that works with white shirts, you know, it's, that's, that's your style. But like, I think most people today are, you know, they got different characters that they're using as their brand. They've got, you know, these, some of these logo trucks, which are getting a little bit ridiculous and redundant, but you know, if, if you're the, the very basic clean, crisp brand, maybe it works, but uh, I think you gotta, everything should be brand consistent. Awesome. Um, you don't think they still do the heat exchanger thing, um, you know, back in the past? Was it like Airtime 500 oh, yeah. guys? I know for a fact. Um, I know for a fact. Somebody is that still around? Is Air, Airtime 500, is that still a thing? Is that even around anymore? Yeah, I think it's called, it's called, it's called something else now. But yeah. there, are, there are a lot of people out there still preaching the, uh, hey, let's, let's go find a, a heat exchanger that's breached. It's, you know, uh, and show the customer and, and, uh, it's not so much that you don't want to do that. You definitely want to do that. That's part of the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, safety measures, et cetera, but it's how you tell it, how you use it. Right. Uh, when you yeah. present it in such a way that it, uh, you know, is potentially harmful to your family and, uh, just, you know, to me, that's about the, the least ethical way you can be in, try and sell something right mm -hmm. exactly they still like they red, red tagging furnaces man it's just unless it's a severe issue that is uh double checked triple checked yeah like i wouldn't be red tagging people's furnaces right, right. that's just yeah crazy. i was i was hoping that didn't happen anymore but i i guess it still does it's not about razzly razzle dazzling the customer that's not what it is it's like you got to have a good system. You got to go in there. You got to yep. diagnose something. You got to follow a protocol. It's got to be, you know, professional, respectable, and you got to be able to communicate your findings, et cetera. But if you have to resort to crazy objection handling and getting 78 no's and uh, have a sales manager that's like, we're not going to leave without taking their money. And because I've heard some of these gurus say that, it's like, you, you don't get it. That's not business. That's just like a, a you know, you're trying to be some, sales guru yeah right? it, uh, like it's just yeah. gross so are, are there gross. gurus out there still teaching you know where you got to have all these extra people to do this all this extra stuff even with the technology we have today like sarah and uh, some others i mean did isn't it like time for us not to over hire i mean yeah, I mean, the model is, see, that's what I'm saying. The model has changed so much. You know, it, we've talked about this before. Just in the last couple of years, the model's changed and, and rapidly advanced. Like, the technology is advanced, uh, the equipment's advanced, the, the, you know, pay scales have changed. Like, everything has changed. There are positions you don't need anymore. I mean, dispatchers are basically general managers now. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. there are things that the technology has enabled that uh, you don't have to have so many people. And that's probably the biggest thing that I see uh, out there. Once a company has any scale at all, once they, they, they hit the, the 5 million mark plus, let's say, mm -hmm. 
And it, it's like there's a couple of them out there that these best practice groups, like I can almost tell which one they belong to based on how many managers they have. Yeah, it's like, well, what do you need managers? All these managers for? It's like I, I need a sales manager, I need an install manager, I need an operations manager, I need a service manager, I need a plumbing manager, I need an air conditioning manager, I need a GM on top of that. It's like, holy crap! You're just you're wasting margin dollars, and you're making the thing completely clunky, inefficient, and it's just not a well functioning yeah. wheel. I've, I've helped some of these guys get rid of six positions that they didn't need because what they do is they say, "Here's your position that you need. Here's all the things that they do." Instead of just saying, here's all the tasks that need to be done, put the person in that box. Yeah. And that person may have three boxes. Or more. But yeah. Because once yeah. you're once you're in the uh in the web, if you will, not the not the uh the uh, internet web, what well, when I'm talking about the spider web, once you're in that spider web, you know, and you have your job duties, it's eventually you're gonna have job duties that are beyond your capabilities and out of what you were hired to do. We just keep stacking it on. And so then we think, okay, we need to hire someone, right? And and the funny thing is, is all the employees are like, no, no, don't hire someone else because now I've got to train them, right? And yep. I, I don't have time. I, you, you've you overloaded my, me as well. And bringing in another person is overloading me plus training someone else. And... And, and we pay- tie a portion of that bonus we were talking about, yeah. that that internal position to to a manpower plan. Yeah. And if you need to hire, you know, our plan calls for seven people in the office. If we have to hire eight, now the bonus potential goes down, or mm-hmm. the bonus potential is spread amongst a wider group. So people are like, oh, we can we can do without that position instead of oh, I'm overworked. You need to hire somebody. I'm overworked. You need to hire somebody. It's like, yeah. well, let's not do that because it may hurt me financially. Yeah. And so, like, we have four four ladies in our office that answer phones, dispatch, handle handle all the stuff that deal with customers, right? Get in, getting them, getting them, you know, all that stuff. And we allow the software to do the majority of the work. Now, when I say we have four people, we're we're over we're going to do over twenty million dollars with four people. And it's so easy. It's like a library in there. You walk in there and it's it's quiet. Things are happening. No one's at hairs on fire. There's no chaos because we built an efficient business. We allow the software to to handle all the chaos, you know, and that's what's different about Sarah. I'm just going to say it out loud. I mean, the software that's out on the market today makes everyone's job harder and forces you to hire more people. And you always got to have an expert on hand just to, to manage it. Modern software is built to get rid of all the waste to to streamline your businesses so they can run better and everybody works better together they get more done and it's more fulfilling it's not hair on fire it's actually doing a job and yeah. that's that's how i run the business and so when you know just think about it a 20 million dollar business with four people managing the calls and everything and the dispatching and everything that's just unheard of and when we have our budgets every year, we go, okay, so this is our budget for next year. How many people do we need to add? And we've asked this question three years in a row. And three years in a row, no one. That's the answer from the people that are, the four that are there. They're like, we've got it so far. And I always say, well, I'm going to put a person in the budget because if you need them at some point, they're in the budget. And we went all the way through 23 and never did it. So... We have to simplify these businesses and make them run efficient yep. in the modern world, and we need to get better service to our customers. I mean, that's what this is about today is it's like you we got to get out of the 1980s and the 1990s, the way we were taught, the things that we do, the things you still do every day. We have to stop, and we have to get prepared for what's coming. The, the new customer doesn't have time for your waste. <laughs> They're going to find someone else. Yeah. There is no brand loyalty. It's all about time. And I think I end every one of my Happy Saturday posts with, it's about time. And it's because it is about time, the customer's time. And if you can manage the customer's time, you can grow a business with with both arms, hands tied behind your back, blindfolded. You know, I work on my, you know, I put this together, worked really hard, got it all put together. 
And now I spend about eight hours a month in my business. That's two hours a week where I'm, you know, I'll, I'll visit with managers. Um, I'll visit with whoever, you know, I'll go talk to my, all the employees. I do roam, I roam around when I'm doing that for the two hours each week. And then I let the business run itself. And then I learn from it. I look, I mean, I'm constantly looking at things to, to get better. And this is what we have to do now. We have to get rid of the waste so that we can be efficient and affordable. AC prices have gone off, gone way too high. And we need to be more affordable so we can sell more. And, you know, I'm 20... 20 to 25% cheaper than my competitors, my big competitors that, and my margins are, you know, 50% higher because of the efficiency side of it. And, and, and that's and a good place to be. Valuable. And it's way more. Because you, you don't even have to be there, right? You're just a passive investor, essentially. Exactly. I invest in the company and then I just watch my investment roll in. That's what I do. Yep. And, 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 and that's when, when someone goes to buy the business, that's what they were looking for. Exactly. You know, exactly what they're looking for. So, all right. Um, yeah. You mentioned one more thing. You mentioned the uh, air conditioners being more, more expensive. So, you know, going back real quick to that conversation we had around compensation, the, the sales commission stuff. So a lot of people uh, it's like, we're recommended to, you know, pay everybody a commission based pay, right? Commission based pay. Uh, for all positions, which again, not inherently bad uh, or good, but but here's the bad about it, right? So when we have this massive inflation that that we've seen in the last couple of years, the cost of, uh, from the OEM distributors have gone up through the roof, right? I, I you know, starting in 2020ish, I bet you we've gone up 40% uh, in price point, right? Yes. When you have that massive inflation, you have to pass it on to the customer, right? But now you've got Everything that's in your direct cost, it's, it's variable that's tied to that, right? Whether your financing costs are variable and tied to that, uh, your your salesperson, your technician, your installer, like uh, all of that is a variable cost when it's commission-based tied to it. So every if you've got 30% commission or uh, a percentage uh, attached to each dollar that goes up, so every dollar that you – uh, getting price increases is a dollar thirty that you got, but then it goes up again because they're commission based, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, why should uh, commission based people get a raise because your cost structure went up? Should, and 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 yeah. what's happened is people that that did that that were on that fifteen years ago that have seen this price increase that's been you know thousands of percent now have salespeople and, and technicians up making uh, absurd amounts of money and they can never hit a reasonable gross margin based on low performance. That's right. And, and it just, it just is, you know, I've seen several companies in this, in your area that are just like, we can't get the company to grow and the margins keep shrinking. It's like, yep. well, it's because everything, there's a commission tied to it. So you can never outrun the commission. You can't. And I was actually on a, on a Zoom with a guy that's uh, involved in a large PE firm and, and, and he wanted to argue about this particular thing about, well, we have it so dialed in, we know what we're going to make when we sell a system. You know, we know our costs because we got a percentage here, we got a percentage there, and we got our material costs, and we have all these costs. And so we know what they are. They're fixed. We know we're going to make good money on this sale. And I go, that's fantastic. What's your close rate? It's about 50%. Okay, so tell me about the 50% you didn't sell. How does that add up? And then at that point, he started realizing, okay, now everything that I sell 50% of the time, 60% of the time is awesome. But I've got that 40 or 50% that I didn't sell and it cost me money. All the same costs were there. You didn't buy equipment, but the costs are there. The overhead costs, all the costs are still there. And so they don't prepare for that. And as the commissions keep going up because prices keep going up, they keep getting further and further from it. They're running from it, just like you said. And it's, it's, it's got, we have to stop that. We have to stop that because things are going to continue to get higher and higher. And it's just going to, it's, it's kind of like the same old story. If you're at 3 million, if I could just get to 5 million, everything would be fine. <laughs> you know, no, yeah. you have $2 million more of problems. 
when you make that leap. If you get the problems at 3 million, you're going to have way more of those problems at 5 million and vice versa. If you go to five to 10, it's just going to be worse. And so one of the things, uh, you know, I, I attend your board meeting, we call it the board meeting every week uh, that you and Lewis put on. And I'm, you know, I've been extremely impressed about, you know, how we dive into these numbers. Like uh, Lewis is a, a number geek and to the point that you and I get lost. Um, and so, you know, in most cases, but we do figure it out eventually. But the point is, is we got to, we got to build efficient businesses that are, are paying for the time we're not making money. You know, how do we make money when we're not making money? And fixing costs is the worst way to do that. It's the opposite of what you need to do. Um, and so I, I recommend that you, you know, I recommend you stop doing it. I mean, obviously, um, we don't do that at all. We don't fix any costs. We, we, um, you get paid on success, right? It's how we do it. And so it's, and it works for everyone and everyone's super happy. So that's a good point that you brought up. And I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you an example um, of what I, I need a water well at my ranch. And four years ago, I had a water well put in same depth that I need now on another, on another ranch I just purchased. I paid $8,500 for this water well four years ago. I got a quote today for $29,000 for the same daggum water well. And that is what's wrong. And this is what you're going to have to overcome as every year this inflation is not going away. And it's not going to go back. They're never going to take it back unless we have a massive correction. But we print money to get out of any trouble we have now. So we just print money. And, and so that's how we get out of trouble temporarily. At some point, that's not going to work. But, um, and I'm talking about the government here printing money um, yeah. to get out of trouble. So just, so the same thing. Ha so I talked to the guy. I'm like, how come we're 8500 to $29,000? And he's like, well, I'll tell you. He said, just the copper line just the copper that I need to run the power is $4 a foot now. He said, PVCs used to be 10 or 15 cents a foot. It's $3 a foot now. The casing that I have to do, go 550 feet of it at $4, my cost. <laughs> and he goes, that's all I can do. He goes, and I'm getting squeezed. I'm making less money at 29000 because everything's so high. I sell less wells. <laughs> and so we have to, we have to learn to build our businesses efficient to offset these enormous price increases that are happening. You can't continue to raise prices and be successful. There's just no way you, you have to get efficient. You have to get simplified to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we've long passed the tipping point. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd, um, anybody want to, when you see this, please comment if you have any suggestions on what kind of shows you would like for us to talk about or what kind of uh, subjects you would like for us to talk about on our show, excuse me. And we'll be happy to do that. We really enjoy doing this. We want to keep, keep you um, informed on the things that sometimes we just don't think about and help you uh, build lean, efficient businesses and tell you about the state of the nation of our industry. And so I want to thank my uh, co-host here, Landon, for another great episode. Um, and Landon, what do you say at the end? Like and subscribe. Smash the like button. There you go. Is that it? There you go. <laughs> Every once, I have to give him the spotlight at the end because, you know, he gets it, you know, he's kind of ego driven. He, he may cry to me or something. So I give him that opportunity every week. So. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You've got to let me have the last word. <laughs> See you guys. All right, bye. No BS with Billy and Landon is produced and delivered to you by Sarah Systems. At Sarah Systems, we've created a better way to run your home service business and unlock unprecedented growth. Our field service software was designed by real home service professionals to help you save steps, charge for previously unbillable time, and win more business. But the true change requires more than software. Our live coaching helps you understand and control the aspects of your business that matter most. It's about time for a new era of service, and we're leading the way. 
If you're ready to join the hundreds of other contractors who've been able to increase profit margins more than 50% within six months, visit sarah.tech today. That's sarah, S-E-R-A dot tech today.